You're watching the Pulse on the Joy News Channel. This afternoon, pressure is mounting on government to release the needed funds to the Kolobu Teaching Hospital to help management clear existing debt and also allow for the reopening of the renal dialysis unit to outpatients. We have details as frustrated members of the Kidney Patients Association say their lives are hanging on a thread. We'll get you the latest on that. Boko Central MP Mahama Ayaraga is this afternoon submitting a petition to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Regional Integration seeking assistance in securing the release of some seven Ghanaians arrested by military officials in Burkina Faso. As to what's accounting for this arrest, we'll find out shortly. The uh, Electoral Commission is also up in the news this afternoon with the EC headquarters being the centre uh, where the chairperson, Jean Menza, will be addressing a press briefing in a few moments from now, there are matters arising on the creation of some new constituencies. We'll explore these and more here on The Pulse, uh, brought to you by Global Communities Digni Lu, Affordable Safe Sanitation. Don't forget that we're on DSTV Channel 421, GoTV 125, on Facebook, YouTube, and at myjoyonline.com. I'm Lester Sugan. Welcome to the program. We'll get your details shortly. And this afternoon, Joy News uh, is learning of some disturbing uh, situations uh, within the northern uh, part of our country as Boku Central MP Mahama Yarga is now submitting a petition to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Regional Integration seeking assistance in, first of all, locating and then securing the release of some seven Ghanaians currently held in Burkina Faso. These individuals were reportedly arrested by the military authorities in the country uh, and uh, their whereabouts as of now remains unknown. Despite uh, Mr. Ayariga's efforts as their member of parliament uh, to secure uh, their release, they have been unable to locate uh, the facility uh, where they've been kept and also uh, unable to secure their return to Ghana. Uh, Mama Yariga says the individuals crossed into Burkina Faso on October 13 and were assisted uh, by the assembly member for the area uh, in one of the suburbs uh, of Magonde, a, a community within the Bitu district uh, of uh, Burkina Faso. Uh, fortunately, we've been joined now by uh, Mahama Yariga, who's joining us uh, via Zoom, uh, to have a brief conversation on this. Thank you, sir, for spending some time with us uh, here on The Pulse. Um, many of us are unaware of uh, the circumstances under which um, these individuals crossed, but what official briefings have you received as Member of Parliament on the circumstances leading to uh, their crossing um, to, to the other side in Burkina Faso? Uh, thank you very much for... Uh, given time and uh, space to this story. Um, seven people, and I have uh, circulated their names and their photographs, uh, who own cattle that were being uh, headed by some Fulani headsmen. Um, the Fulani headsmen, you know, crossed over to the Burkina side with the cattle, and then military personnel from the Burkina Bay Armed Forces came, fired gunshots, in the process even killed two uh, Fulani headsmen. And then they drove all the cattle to the nearest town, which is Bitu. Bitu is a town on the other side of the border with uh, Boku in Burkina Faso. So there was an announcement in Bitu that uh, the owners of the cattle should come and identify their cattle so that they will return the animals to them. And so these seven uh, residents of Boko, whose cattle were among those that were driven to Bitu Town, actually went to the municipal assembly, got a letter of introduction, and went across and tried to identify the location of the animals. They were directed to the village where the animals were kept, and on their way there, um, the last uh, story we had is that some military officers stopped them. They were having some interrogation and discussions and etc. I just saw them and passed by. And since then, they have not been seen again. All effort to locate them, even within uh, uh, Burkina Faso, has been futile. Uh, the local government authorities, they are not giving us any information. Nobody knows their whereabouts. So we're asking the Minister of Foreign Affairs to reach out to their counterparts in Wagaduku so that uh, the government of Burkina Faso, the military authorities, can uh, cause uh, some investigation in that area so we can locate where these seven individuals are. 
Uh, do you suspect that the reason for which uh, these individuals might have crossed into the other side, Burkina Faso, is simply because of their commercial interest? Uh, is that a known um, trading line of, of cattle uh, within the community where, where they crossed over? Yes, just to go and identify their cattle and then return them to Ghana. And there was an announcement by the Burkina Bay authorities in B2 that if your cattle was among those that... Uh, uh, they uh, arrested and took to uh, that village where they were kept. You should come and identify them so that they will give them back to me. So they went to identify their animals with a view to retrieving them and then returning them to Ghana. That was the only reason why they crossed to the other side. As you will know, Boku and then Boku borders Burkina Faso. So a lot of the communities, you know, are so close that they have uh, family on either side. They have business on either side. Uh, sometimes when people are rearing animals, they may not even know exactly who. Uh, we'll, we'll just uh, get some updates for you uh, shortly from the Member of Parliament who've uh, uh, just uh, gone off the line. Uh, but... Uh, the latest we're receiving is that these seven individuals are nowhere to be found after they crossed into Burkina Faso. Uh, for now, a petition has been sent to the foreign uh, ministry, and that's where we left off, Honorable Minis- uh, uh, MP. Uh, apologies, because we lost you briefly. Uh, now the point about the petition you've sent to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Regional Integration. Uh, exactly what's the demand, and how soon would you want them to act on this matter? The reason is that we've been trying to use other channels and... We've met roadblocks. The Municipal Security Council um, is unable to engage directly with the local government on the other side of the border. The Regional Security Council, RECSEC, uh, hasn't really been able to make progress. I have spoken to senior military personnel uh, on on the Ghana side. They all say, as we've heard the story, but we have no way of finding out what has happened on the other side of the border. So it appears that um, it goes beyond interior ministry or, you know, national security here. It's now a matter that I believe the foreign affairs ministry will use all the channels available to them to be able to um, get counterparts on the Burkina Bay side to look into the matter, send word to B2 and then find out exactly what has happened to them, their whereabouts, and then we can then find a way of... Uh, uh, getting them back to, to Ghana. Uh, the fear about, um, you know, what's happening in Burkina Faso as we speak, uh, that country is under uh, full military control now. Uh, do, don't you fear as well that that might be um, a setback in, in that speedy um, location and also facilitation of their return uh, to Ghana? Well, I'm sure even though there the, are um, some portions of the country that have been under some terrorist uh, attack, um, including that part of the country. Uh, it seems that the military has regained control over that portion of the country. So I believe that, um, and we're told that those who stopped them were actually military officers. If they were bandits or jihadists, uh, our informants would have told us, but they were actually members of the armed forces of uh, Burkina Faso. So uh, it means that if the authorities in Ouagadougou reach out to the units that are in that part of the country. They can cause an investigation as to the location of uh, these persons. Uh, personally, you're a member of the um, ECOWAS uh, parliament, I believe. Uh, you've been, I'm sure you've been trying your own diplomatic lines um, to try and reach out to the Burkina Bay authorities. Uh, what sort of response are you getting? Well, unfortunately... Because of the military coup, the parliament in uh, Burkina Faso has been shut down. Mm. So all parliaments, parliaments are, uh, many of them really, I believe, um, uh, they honestly told me they were unable to help because they don't really have relations with uh, the military junta. So they couldn't really, you know, be of any help. I have reached out to a chief. Uh, on the other side of the border. And uh, for several days, he really couldn't give me any concrete information about the whereabouts. And that is why, finally, I just thought that we needed to activate formal diplomatic uh, uh, ties uh, 
that we may have. Uh, I believe that the Foreign Affairs Ministry will have a way. We have an ambassador in, in, in Burkina Faso, and if the foreign minister should uh, instruct the ambassador to travel to that part of the country and then, uh, carry out some inquiries and then report back, I'm sure we'll get some indication. We've given the names of the locations and the persons involved in the district and even the village. So I believe that you know the authorities there can easily uh, cause an investigation. Uh, in the meantime, the families of uh, the victims, uh, what, what plans do you have for them? And, and I'm just imagining how they are, they are feeling right now. Well, they are naturally devastated, and uh, there's nothing I can do beyond uh, working as hard as we can to locate them and return them back home. I'm sure that is a, a main thing that the family would be looking for. Uh, and as we wrap up this conversation, uh, one more time, your message to the foreign ministry and what would you want all Ghanaians to know about the situation that we're hearing? Well, I mean, basically, it is what I have indicated, that Ghanaians went on the other side and then they cannot be located, they cannot be uh, found, and they haven't come back home since the 13th of um, last, uh, last month. So, so this is a worrisome matter, and um, I believe that... Uh, as a country, we have a responsibility to look out for our citizens and then secure their safe return home. I thought that would have been the last, but do you suspect, and, and that might be the very last leg of our conversation, do you suspect any remote connection to, you know, bandits or violent extremists who may be acting on the other side of the border? Because the uh, president has raised that concern before uh, about how insecure and volatile that, that region is. Yes, that region uh, was insecure and volatile for a while, but the district in which uh, my constituents went into, I believe, uh, is under the control of the regular military of uh, Burkina Faso. And as I indicated, uh, eyewitnesses who last spotted them said they were seen in the presence of the military, the regular armed forces uh, of Burkina Faso. Um, our people will know if they, 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 they have met bandits, if, if, if um, they encountered jihadists, and, and etc. Our people would have known. As, as, we, uh, as I've indicated, there was actually a formal announcement by the military in B2 that if your animal is among those that were arrested by them, you should, you should come and identify your animals and then take it. And so um, they went on the basis and on the strength of that uh, announcement. So we are praying that uh, it has nothing to do with uh, bandits and, and etc. We are praying that uh, maybe they are in the custody of the military. Maybe they suspected them of something and have arrested them. I are praying that it is something like that so that mm. we can you know, uh, get them uh, released and then return back home. And just by way of caution, uh, we don't know for a fact, but looking at uh, that common trade within your uh, constituency, some other, um, you know, cattle herders may may want to cross over again to uh, to check if they are, um, you know, cattle is on the other side of the border. What message of caution do you have for them, knowing that these seven already have been arrested? Well, I mean, as you know, our borders are very porous, and the communities along the borders tend sometimes to be economically and socially integrated and linked. So it is not that easy to live in these border towns and then adhere to a strict, you know, uh, regulation as to don't go across, because sometimes they actually have family members on the other side. They cross over to attend funerals, to attend uh, marriage ceremonies and outdoors and etc. And then their economies are sometimes even integrated. You will have a market day on the Ghana side and then you have a market day on the Burkina Faso side. And so you have many people in Boku who attend the B2 market, which is the market of the town on the other side. So every market day, you know, tracks of, you know, uh, traders will cross over and attend the market the same way that, you know, people from the Burkina Faso side 
on market days in Boko Town, would also cross over and sell their cattle and animals and then cross back with their money. So we were economically and then socially, you know, related. And so it's difficult to say don't cross the borders. But they understand the security situation on that uh, part of uh, uh, the country and uh, they've been cautious, except that, you know, you can never be too cautious. All the best and uh, hope that uh, we'll get uh, some formal response from the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs and Regional Integration. Grateful uh, for spending some time with us. Uh, MP for Boku Central, Mahama Yarga, uh, speaking to us there this afternoon. Uh, in the health sector, pressure is mounting on government to release the needed funds uh, to the Kolibu Teaching Hospital to help manage their existing debt and also allow the uh, health facility to reopen the renal dialysis unit to outpatients. It's coming at the time uh, when the CEO of Kolibu Teaching Hospital, Dr. Pukuwari Ampoma, is revealing that the unit owes 4 million cities, uh, the reason for which the renal dialysis unit was shut out to patients. Uh, here is more. Uh, we've been under recovering for some time now. As I said, our prices were set about three years ago. So this, uh, if I, and you should also appreciate where we've come from. When dialysis started in Kolibu, the average cost per session was around about $100 per session, equivalent of $100. And now the price has come down considerably. As of today, we we but the current we are now recovering for the current uh, present. So we also need to much as we sympathize the patients, we also need to keep the service sustainable. And so First Sky support has been very very tremendous in helping us to be able to provide service for about eighty percent free that is for eighty percent of the patients that we treat. Unfortunately, because of the increase in the cost of the consumables. Not the increase in the cost as such, because in, the, in, uh, in Forex it's the same. But uh, when it comes to the city equivalent, it's gone up. So we need to, uh, you know, make the, those adjustments. And so that is a uh, situation. In fact, as we stand now, the Rina unit has a deficit or has a financial deficit of 4 million cities that we need to, uh, you know, that we are trying to find ways of... Is, is that debt? Yes, that's or you the debt. owe a supplier? No, it's debt. Yes, debt. Debt that we owe. To How do you accrue that? Uh, How was that accrued? It's because of, of the under recovery from the, from the service that we are providing. And so to continue to run at full throttle uh, would mean that with this debt is going to balloon. Okay? And that is why there was a need for us to look at adjusting the, uh, the, the, you know, the price whilst we also engage with the next relevant stakeholders to see how best this deficit can be met. So on that uh, thought leadership roundtable, presidential advisor on health, Dr. Ansia Sari, assured that government will intervene uh, and deal with the situation. Sadly, the situation remains the same. Frustrated members of the Kidney Patients Association say their lives are hanging on the thread uh, as the renal dialysis unit at Kolivu Teaching Hospital remains closed to outpatients. Uh, they are asking for help. Kidney patients who patronized the Kulebu Teaching Hospital's renal unit for dialysis were full of hope following the assurance by health authorities that they will intervene to reopen the unit to OPD following Joy News' thought leadership program on the dialysis crisis. After several weeks of assurance, the unit still remains closed, causing distress among people with kidney conditions. The affected patients say their conditions keep worsening by the day. Reverend Daniel Hammond speaks for the patients. As we speak, the cabin is still close to outpatients, and that is having a devastating effect on the patients. The death toll has risen from 14 patients of our last press conference to 19 patients. Lives are being lost needlessly due to the lack of adequate dialysis. They are making a passionate appeal to the government to expedite its intervention in order to restore the unit to its former state. We humbly appealing to the government again to help us and ensure these four things. One, to provide the needed support for the unit at Kolebu to settle 
uh, indebtedness of 4 million Ghana City to uh, suppliers so that OPD cases can resume at Kolebu Rena units immediately. Aside from the appeal to government to open the Renal to OPD, the patients are appealing to corporate Ghana, NGOs, religious organizations, and philanthropists to assist them in footing their medical bills. Well, let's get more on this. Uh, joining us now is a member of the Kidney Patients Association of Ghana, Kojobafo uh, Ahinkra, who is uh, also part of the leadership mounting pressure uh, on the management of the hospital to deal with this situation. Kojo, uh, it's a good time to be talking to you. Um, uh, because many just do not understand um, the government of the issue at stake, the fact that your health matters most at this time. How challenging is it for a renal patient trying to assess uh, uh, you know, health care at the Kolebu Teaching Hospital now? Thank you very much. Currently, uh, there is nothing like um, just accessibility there for the outpatient. Mm-hmm. Right? Let, me, mm-hmm. let me be more specific. The right. outpatient. We are normally about 250. The place was closed down to us uh, May 22nd of this year. And as we speak now, it's still, still not open. And for the information of the public, many are not aware that uh, this is just part of the very few centers that treat or, I mean, carry out the dialysis treatment. Yes. Um, how bad is the situation now for many of your members? Very bad because, you know, Kolibu, because it's a public place, yeah. the price was a bit more moderate, like the, what you just paid. Right. But those outside are now private, and they are charging to make profit. So you can imagine. I mean, the least you can get is about around 600 per section. Most of us are doing two to three sessions a week. Um, ideally, the NC people are supposed to do three sessions a week. And because of financial constraints, all of them are doing two sessions mm. a week now. Mm. Yeah. So it's very, very, very Look, bad. I recall you being part of that thought leadership program we did here on the Joy News uh, yes, platform. Yes. The CEO of the Kolibuti King Hospital was here. The assurance was given uh, that the problems will be dealt with. You're surprised uh, that nothing is happening? Sure. Sure. Nothing. Uh, I have been speaking with the Kolibu CEO. Oh, well, he made me understand that there are things in place. They are working on things. Because if you quite remember, they said that uh, if they are supposed to go by the 380, that is the old price, then they're supposed to, there will be some cutoff, which they need to refund that money. So the analysis that he does was that that money will be like around 900 and something. I've forgotten the figure. That if they allow us to do the 380, yes. So he, he say, and then there's another option that either we go for 550, mm-hmm. that one too, there will be there's supposed to be a subsidy of about 400 and something. That one. So now the third is on. So, on the table for government to choose whether we are doing the 380 or we are doing the 550. So, we've not had anything. As renal patients, are you willing to take up the full cost if it, if it will mean that the centre would be reopened? Nobody can sustain that. Right. It's not sustainable. Because the dialysis is a lifetime something, unless you go for transplant. So maybe if you are not going for transplant, you are going to be on the machine. For me, I've been on the machine eight years. My account is zero. That will mean more cost to you. Yes, more cost. Mm. Now my account is zero. So even if you have thousands of money, the more you go, the more you go. So if some does not come to add up to it, there you go. So the best thing we can do, the government have to step in. We are appealing to him. We can't fight him. We can't do anything. But we are losing lives. As at the time we did the first presser, it was 14. Now we have 19 people gone. Right. Right. So you can imagine. We don't even know. Uh, we heard this news from Dr. Kuboy that they were supposed to move to the... The NHI. NHI is, uh, yeah, that was another consideration on the table. Any news yet? We all were here from Dr. Kuboy is going to take them between 6 to 12 months. That is a year. So you can imagine within that time the number of people that we are dying. So there should be something. Something should um, come up right now so that uh, whilst they are considering that, at least, I mean, those with the kidney cases can have some lives. Mm. Yeah, because it's, it's not, it's, it's not, it's it must be really challenging for you. Uh, we're, we're wrapping up the conversation, but you are also in, in that lived experience. What message do you have to the authorities who are watching us now? And what would you want them to know about the, you know, how delicate and serious this issue is? Okay, thank you. It's three, three things that we are appealing to the government to do. The first thing is should look at the taxes on the consumables and the dialysis machine. Now, let me do this simple mathematics. If they say, okay, they are going to help Kolibu, just in Accra here, 
we have about 10 to 15 dialysis centers. All of them have their patients. Now, any sensible person, once Kolebu begins to do something very good, everybody will move to Kolebu. So the pressure will be on Kolebu. So if the taxes are moved off from the consumable, the private sectors can also bring their prices down, whereby people can easily go there to afford it. That is the first point. Secondly, if the government really is going to do about the subsidy, please, they should fast track it for us. We beg them. And then the lastly, you see, we are begging um, these big churches and other villages. We are begging them. This church, Bikesh Sapo, Bodin Abiche, came to do some donation to us. They should emulate from him the Church of Pentecost, ICGC, uh, Duncan Williams. They should take one Sunday when they collect all the correction. They should come and give it to us. So that at least it can also pay the four million the Kolibusi was also talking about. These are the three points we put out because we are just. I see. Uh, and that uh, challenge is on Join News is definitely joining the challenge. Could you thank you uh, and, and stay strong? Uh, we'll definitely be raising that awareness. You can also support uh, the renal uh, patients so they, they can, uh, you know, uh, support the dialysis treatment. Uh, we uh, will be uh, crossing over shortly to the EC's uh, press briefing. But uh, just before we even do that, could you, I almost forgot about this, you know, uh, the point about uh, dealing with uh, the other health facilities, those of your members who are up north. Uh, what, what, what are you advising them as a, as a society to be doing now, um, even as, you know, this centre is not available? Because many of them have to come from up north, down, down south. Per the information we have, the Tamale Regional Hospital has got some, I think about five machines, which they are doing in there. But I learned that uh, the patient rate is keep going up. So, like, once again, the government to all the regional hospitals, they should put the allergies machines. Because in our case in Kolibu, we, I can't, we have about two people. One is coming from Begro in the eastern region. Another one is coming from Kibi in the eastern region to come and do the dialysis in Accra. So if Kofudra is having maybe about six or ten machines there, they wouldn't travel all the way to Accra, you see. Yeah. And then those of us in Accra to be fine. Kumasi is doing well. But one thing is that those people, they are still maintaining their charges. But Kolibu keep going. But I understand Kolibu. The machines that we are using is one of the latest the physicians has given it to us. And so once you go on it and you finish, you can see that it's easier, yeah, right? Mm. Yeah, clear. But but um, you know the private health facilities. Is there anything you know any window in terms of negotiation that you can you can explore with them in the meantime? Have you tried that? Oh, I mean they have already gone for the consumables. Right. They've paid taxes on them, so you don't expect them to lose. The only thing I would suggest is that I think uh, Kolibu or maybe uh, Ghana Health Service or they should get a monitoring team to monitor these private dialysis centers. Because some of them, uh, I'm not an expert, but what I know is that I think they are not doing well. They are not doing well with the, the treatment. I mean, you know, dialysis is about water treatment. It entails a lot. If the water is not good, you are even killing the patient. Right. You are even killing the patient. So that is another thing I also put across, that they should get a monitoring team to be monitoring these private dialysis centers. Because we cannot have any negotiation with them. He is going to bring his things down. He wants his money. We don't expect him to lose. Even if Kolebu wants to break even, how much my private sector? In the coming days, what, what should we expect from you? Since uh, you're pointing to us that, well, you've tried, you've spoken to the CEO, you've tried other uh, means, uh, you don't seem to be getting any result. Um, is, is there anything you're planning to do as an association to raise more awareness? Oh, well, yes. What we are trying to do now, I think we need to go to the private sector. Since it's all about money in the churches, like I just put that pay like that. That's what we want to go to them. In the, like he said, first guy is doing a lot for us. I think he has done a lot for us. But um, one person, one person. So um, we'll be going to the churches, other private organizations, to appeal to them if they can help us to clear that four million, which Dr. Anzia, as I promised, we've not heard this from right. them. They will promise if we can clear that debt. And then we want to have a fund. So that maybe some donations can be going in, so we can fall on it to be maybe to be supporting. Well, could you? Uh, we'll definitely uh, be on this matter and engage again. Uh, you're watching the polls here on the Joy News Channel. We're taking a break, uh, but when we return, uh, we'll tell you about the Electoral Commission's plan towards creating some new uh, constituencies going into the 2024 elections. Uh, chairperson of the Commission, Jean Mensah, will be addressing a press briefing. Uh, a few. Uh, minutes from now, live pictures there of the headquarters as you see. When we return, we'll take you there. Please stay.
Every day, people have money emergencies. Mom, I need my school fees. Emergency. Mom, it's your money emergency. Emergency, emergency. Catch it. I'm your rent. Emergency. Now, there's a new emergency number in town. More money, more money, challenge and enjoyment. At the top life, we got it. Dial star 770 hash for all your money emergencies. Dial star 770 hash for money emergencies and get easy and quick access to your money, loans, and other banking needs. Echo Bank, the Pan African Bank. Daddy, Daddy, this tank is big! Yes, that's true. It can store a lot of water. That's so true. Wow. Has a working tortoise by it. Mm hmm. That's so true. I can see S I N T E S syntax. That is so true, my daughter. When it falls down, it will spoil. That's not true. But why? Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> Syntex was the first to introduce double layer tanks in Ghana. Syntex again was the first to introduce white inner layers in Ghana. Syntex gives you the biggest warranty seven years. No matter your water needs, Syntex is the answer. Syntex tank. Are you strong? Are you tough? Smile, hmm? Look lively, okay? Smile, smile. Is the money too small? A bad stomach ruins your day. Don't let it. Take Gastron, your most effective antacid, for the relief of symptoms of peptic ulcer, heartburn, gas pain, flatulence, and indigestion. Hey guys, what are you waiting for? Let's go, let's go. Mwah. Can you bring down that smile small? <laughs> Gastro, effective relief from stomach discomfort. Manufactured and distributed by NS Chemist Limited. This advertisement has been written and approved by the oh. The 2023 EcoBank Joy News Habitat Fair is more than an exhibition. It's the gateway to your dream home. Don't miss this chance to make informed decisions about every aspect of your living space. Join us at the Accra International Conference Center from Thursday, November 23rd to Sunday, November 26th, 2023. This year, we are diving into the theme of home ownership, exploring the nuances between affordability, comfort, and luxury. We are bringing everything housing under one roof just for you. See you there. The EcoBank Joy News Habitat Fair is in partnership with EcoBank, the Pan-African Bank, and powered by the Plant City Extension Project from Cities and Habitats, Rent to Own, and sponsored by Elegant Homes and General Constructions Limited, where quality meets value. Global Lighting, your solution to quality lighting. Syntex Tank, Air Strong, Air Tough, Springfield Estates, where dreams are built. Virtual Security, Complete Security Solution, DBS, your roof experts, Virtual InfoSec Africa, Security Solutions by Design, St. Gobain, Making the World a Better Plan, Clifton Homes, Beautiful Homes, Wise Investments, The Kissington Heights, Airport City, Kumasi, by HDG Homes Limited. And thanks for staying with us here on the Polls on the Joy News uh, channel. Uh, we need to bring you an update on a developing story on the South African Church of uh, Pentecost, the TAT, uh, where the Ghana's High Commission in South Africa is now confirming to us that the Dickin who has been kidnapped has now officially, uh, as uh, the sources are indicating to us, 
have been released. Um, also, uh, these are the pictures that we, show, we saw uh, circulating and going viral on social media where uh, that uh, deacon at the Church of Pentecost in South Africa uh, was then attacked by uh, some unknown gunmen uh, with the commission asking all Ghanaians resident in uh, Johannesburg to be cautious out there. Well, fortunately, there's an update, uh, even though the church says it will continue uh, to pray and to fast for all Christians uh, around the world. Uh, today uh, is also a significant uh, point uh, in the relations between the Republic of Ghana and South Africa as the um, reciprocal visa waiver arrangement is taking effect uh, today. And that's why we're fortunate to be joined now by uh, Charles Oredo, who is, is the, uh, South Af- uh, the Ghana's High Commissioner uh, to South Africa, joining us uh, in studio now. It's such a pleasure to be talking to you, uh, sir. And uh, Akwaba, <laughs> you, you, you know, you've been busy moving up and down. Uh, after, for, for, after, for, after, after this meeting in, 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 in South, South Africa. Africa. Was it this yes. year? This year, exactly. the break summit, yeah, the break huh? summit yeah. indeed. And I, I just disappeared. Now you're, you're appearing <laughs> uh, before us again. Uh, but it's uh, good news, first of all, to uh, point out that now, at least, we found the Deacon. Um, how how did, did, did that happen, first of all? So, uh, thank you. So, after that unfortunate news, um, we quickly had to uh, activate, you know, the processes of calming down Ghanaians. And then because a lot of Ghanaians were jittery, uh, people were shaking. They wanted to find out what was happening. Uh, after us uh, informing the foreign minister about the incident, normally that's what we are supposed to do. Yep. Uh, I summoned my team, and then we decided to issue a statement. So if you, if you saw yeah. that first statement that was issued, yes. uh, that statement was to allay the fears of Ghanaians because we had made contact with the police, and then they had told us yeah. that they were on top of the game, they were on top of the issue, and that uh, we should just calm down. So that uh, 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 notice sought to calm the nerves of Ghanaians, and then subsequently we engaged the, uh, uh, the church authorities, uh, the, meaning the... Uh, the leadership of the uh, Pentecost Church in Johannesburg, and then also the family. Uh, yesterday in the evening, we were there when we got wind uh, from the police uh, that uh, they freed uh, the, the, the victim, uh, the deacon, and that uh, he's been sent uh, to his family. Uh, people are asking whether monies were paid, whether they were, mm-hmm. but then I, t- I tell yeah. them that, that that's none of my business. Right. I'm interested in securing the, the Ghanaian. You know, so once the, the person is secured, mm-hmm. whatever happened, I'm not uh, privy to that uh, information. So I cannot say anything to that. But, but what then, official accounts were you given by South Africa's uh, law enforcement agencies as to probably the identity of these gunmen involved uh, in the exercise, uh, and what more uh, official so, reports are you receiving? So, at that time, mm. they told me they were in, still investigating. Right. So then when they called, and then they said that, okay, they freed, you know, now the, our brother is freed, and then he's been sent back to the family. Uh, I started asking questions, right. but then they said, okay, they were still, uh, still doing the investigations, and that we should hold on. As and when they, 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 they finalized everything, they will let us know. So for me, like I told you earlier, I'm happy that he's back home, he's free, he's now with his family. Uh, Whatever there is, you know, after, later, we will look at it and then take it as an opportunity to beef up security, take care of ourselves better. And then because I still tell Ghanaians that uh, nobody can provide that security that you need better than yourself. Mm. The South African government will do their best, but you are your own security. Mm. So as you go about your duties, please watch your left, watch your right. I always say that uh, this is what happened uh, to me is an outlier. Right. You know, uh, I've been in South Africa as the High Commissioner over two years, six months, and this is the first time I've seen this brazen, you know, attack, yeah. you know, on worshippers where uh, people were robbed of their monies and their jewelries and and and, and whatnot. Uh, I believe that uh, I've you know travelled a lot. Uh, right. My background as a right. former Deputy Foreign Minister, I've visited a lot of countries, and then South Africa is not different you know, from some of the things, pockets of, you know, uh, criminality right, yeah. that you see across the globe. Yeah. Yes, but then generally, South Africa is a beautiful country, you know. Cape Town, to me, is the most beautiful city in the world. Yeah. I've visited a lot of uh, cities, and I can tell you, you were there. Right. And then I'm already preaching to the converted. <laughs> yes. Apart from that, yeah. the opportunities there for Ghanaians. Yes. That's yes. why you have a lot. 
a lot of Ghanaians. Uh, we'll talk about the visa regime which is taking effect today, uh, but what's the caution to the Ghanaian community now? Um, yeah, so, because in your previous statement, you asked them to be cautious you know, when, when moving out these days. Yes, yeah, still, uh, like I told you earlier, uh, you need to take care of your own security. Mm -hmm. Government, the South African government will do their best, but you need to take care of your own security. Whatever you go, you know, you watch your left, you watch your right. And now with the last conversation that I had with the leader of the church, uh, Prof. Pentecost in right. Johannesburg, he told me that now they are going to beef up security at the church. In Ghana, most of, most of our churches do have security. In Ghana. Right. Yes, if you go to, if you visit most of the churches, they have security people stationed in front of, of, of the church and in front of the, of the, of the premises. And then uh, as you enter, you know, the main church hall. But South Africa... So, so this was not the case no, 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 in, 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 in no, this no, very no, attack? No, no. They had no they, security? They had attack. somebody, but then not something that you can say that uh, a, a well-trained security person. But now they'll just beef up. And then it's also uh, a wake-up call to all the other churches in South Africa that now these days, uh, hitherto, we thought that people could not enter the house of God and then do what they did. But then... Uh, people are doing this, so we need to beef up security in those. Well, well th this is also raising concerns, and I'm sure you've seen some of the comments on social media, uh, you know, questioning what exactly um, your team is doing there in South Africa to secure the interest of Ghanaians abroad. In this very case, do you take any responsibility? The fact that, as you're pointing to us, they, they were just released. Uh, you, you did not pay any ransom to, 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 to get them released. Yeah, so if you say we should take yeah. the response, I don't know what responsibility you, <laughs> you want the High Commission to take. Right. Uh, because uh, we don't provide law and order, you know, that's done by the state police. Right. Uh, we can just augment that what the state police does. Mm. As I go around engaging the Ghanaian community, I've taught all the provinces in South Africa. Right. In everywhere that I've been, I've met the Ghanaian community, I've told them, that we need to be each other's keeper, we need to provide security for ourselves, we need to take care of ourselves. And then uh, I, I think that, the, by and large, you know, the Ghanaian community in South Africa have conducted themselves really, really well. Uh, I've been in South Africa over two years, six months. I've never had any report of a Ghanaian involved in any criminal act. Right. You know, so I think that probably what we've been telling them is sinking, and then they are conducting themselves really well. But these things do happen. And then when they happen, we learn from them, and then uh, we, we, we use that as a step, a step stone, you know, to uh, beef up our, our security. It's good country. that you're in Ghana today. Uh, are you meeting the leadership of the Church of Pentecost here? Is that part uh, of the plan? That's, that, that's the plan. Right. Mm. And then uh, I just got in, and then, uh, uh, you know, your, your people, the right. media, all over, they, you know, they want interviews and yeah. all that. So once I'm done, you are going to be the last... Uh, media organization that I'm having this interaction with. Uh, we've made some contacts. Uh, we'll meet them and uh, tell them uh, what we're also doing mm. on our own. But by and large, uh, I think that uh, the matter uh, is under, uh, under, under, under investigation by the police uh, because now that they've secured the release of you know, the victim, what about the robbery? You know, so it's something that the police is seized with and then they are, they are working mm. on. And, and the issues of robbery has also been of concern to some of the uh, Ghanaians living in South Africa that we, we, we spoke, uh, spoke to. Um, have you conveyed that message to the South African government as well? Oh, of course, uh, there, there are some pockets. I would not say that it's something that is taking over, right. you know, as a culture in South Africa. No, I wouldn't say that uh, because I live there. And that uh, generally, generally, the security is not bad. Uh, the government is doing its best, you know, to uh, provide uh, security to the people. Uh, but sometimes you have some elements, some rogue elements, you know, who would want to do this uh, criminal activities. But then government is doing its best. We're also telling Ghanaians anytime we meet them that they need to, you know, provide their own security. If I say provide their own security, it's not about them also having guns and what, but then take care of themselves really well. Don't go to where you're not expected to go. Mm. And they cast across everywhere. Mm. Even in Ghana, there are some places that you cannot, mm. yourself, you cannot walk mm. in the night and then, you know, expect to be, to, to go, you know, scot-free. Just that you just manage yourself in such a way that you are not found wanting. I see. Uh, 
the belief is this is overshadowing, you know, uh, what's happening today. Uh, the fact that Ghana has successfully secured an MOU with the South African government to run this uh, reciprocal uh, visa arrangement. Uh, this is now allowing Ghanaians to freely move into South Africa and also South Africans moving in uh, to, today. Do, don't you feel that this incident had, has overshadowed the beauty of what's happening today? I, I, I totally disagree. Uh, is, what hap- whatever happened is unfortunate. But then I think that the, the, the news last night, you know, of, of the release of the victim has sort of served as an impetus to the operationalization of this visa waiver uh, agreement that we signed with the South African government. Uh, we did a test run the last week, and then everything seemed perfect. Uh, so if, yesterday I posted on, on, on Twitter, and then I gave some numbers that if you should encounter any problem at the point of entry in South Africa, please do call these oh, numbers. Yeah. Uh, this morning I've checked and I've been told that it was very, very smoothly done. Right. You know, all Ghanaians that, entered, that arrived this morning in South Africa, you know, uh, 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 without visa, because that's what the argument is supposed to be. You know, they were just, you know, ushered in. They had their own queue, right. a very fast, fast queue, while others that had visas, you know, were in long queues. They just went through the processes and then they just exited. So I think that it's a good thing for trade, for business, uh, you know that we do a lot of trade with South Africa. Most of these big, big, big companies here are South African companies. It's going to step up that you know relationship that we have with them. People to people contact. You right. know. People, South Africans are desirous of spending Christmas in Ghana. You know, Ghana is the is the hotbed for Christmas in right. Africa. And then this year, you you're going to see a, a, an influx of yeah. South Africans here. You know, to celebrate uh, Christmas. This would sort of uh, 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 solidify or cement that already burgeoning relationship that we have uh, with the South Africans. So I, I, I'm, I'm, I'll not take it yeah. if somebody tells me that uh, whatever happened, you know, is going to mar. Right. That, uh, so, so by way of education, um, so, you know, because a lot of people are watching, excited yeah. about the fact that, well, I'm just moving in free of charge into yeah. South Africa. W- what do they need to be mindful of as they, uh, you know, take advantage of this window? Okay, so it's a 90-day visa waiver that is cumulative. Right. Cumulative means that any time you visit South Africa, it will be subtracted from the 90 days within a year. Right. So you have 90-day calendar year. If you decide to visit South Africa for 10 days, it will be subtracted from the 90. So now you are left with 80 days. Right. You visit again, you are left with you know, whatever days that uh, you decide to spend. If you should exhaust all the 90 days within the calendar year right. and you still would want to visit South Africa, you need to go for a, for a visa. After, you know, After the exhaustion of the, the 90, 90 days, days, you yeah. need to go for yeah. a fresh visa from, from the South High Commission right. here in Accra. Right. You have two options. You can decide to do it one shot, visit South Africa and spend 90 days and then come home. Or do it. Or do it thought by thought. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, uh, and even if you want to take all 90, it will not be possible this year. <laughs> because the 90 will not be No, it's, it's a calendar year. Yeah, obviously. Okay, yeah, so, right. So yeah, it, it, it will not be possible for you to take advantage of the 90. So, so, so to the, and again, the validity of your yeah. passport, mm-hmm. it shouldn't be less than six months. Okay. So if you know your passport is less than six months, please go and renew, renew your passport. Right. Luckily, these days, we have 10-year passports. Right. So go and renew and then uh, you can you, you, you can you can you can benefit. sounds really exciting. Yeah. Uh, but but what's the point of interest for our country? What do we stand to benefit, uh, knowing that this uh, agreement is coming into force? Yeah, so you're going to have a lot of businesses from South Africa, you know, who would want to come to Ghana and then forge partnerships. But that's what we want. Mm-hmm. Uh, being in South Africa, I've met a lot of conglomerates, big 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 big. You know, you've been there, you know, big big businesses. Mm-hmm who would want to visit Ghana. But sometimes they even complain about the visa regime. Yeah, so sure. when they come, they issue visa, they would have to come. You know, for business, they don't so want these. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. They just want to just pick their passport and just... Because every day that you delay, mm. it affects, you know, productivity. Mm. So this is going to help. Again, for those of us who would want to visit, you know, just go and then visit, uh, that's also a very good opportunity for you. You know, you don't have to... This, the, for the past two or three months, you know what happened? Ghanaians who wanted visas from the South African the high had to that. go there and, and all that. But now, you know, we've eased the process. And then... So we're expecting that trade volumes between the two countries will increase as a result of this. Uh, we're also expecting that uh, the people-to-people contact will also increase. 
And then once we, that, we, once we do that, uh, the opportunities that come out of it uh, to be to the mutual benefit of these two countries. Mm. Uh, and at the continental level, this is being lauded because it's uh, giving further impetus to the African Union's protocol on, on the free movement of, uh, of individuals. We've seen Kenya, for instance, express that uh, willingness to you know, expand and taking all Africans by the, by the end of, of the year. Do you feel that this is something Ghana should also be considering, uh, expanding more, liberalizing, you know, our, our regime more for more and more people to come through? But as we speak now, we have a lot of such arrangements with a lot of the African countries. Uh, I handle five countries. Seychelles, Lesotho, Mauritius, uh, uh, Eswatini, and then South Africa. All right. these five countries. You don't need visas right. to enter, you know. If you're a Ghanaian. So that in itself is a plus. Is, yeah. Now we've added Mozambique. Right. You know, apart from Mozambique, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, you know, South of the way, yes. Those. So there are a lot of these countries. ECOWAS is there. You know, all the fifteen countries right. you don't need visas to enter each other's country. So that arrangement's already in place. But then like you're saying, it will be good for us, free movement, you know, we want to see a lot of such movement. So that as an African you don't have to get a visa and then you enter into your neighbor's country. Just uh, because it, it, it helps you know, businesses. And that's what we all want to see happen. Because as businesses flourish, mm. unemployment will reduce, a lot of opportunities will be created in these countries. Mm. And that's what we all want to there, see There happen. are those on the other side as well who say we are opening up too much. We've allowed the Continental Free Trade Area headquarters to be here. We're allowing more and more uh, people on the international scene to come into our system. Is there any neg- negative side to this? That oh, of course. This? For any of such things, the, you need to be mindful that uh, some rogue element may take advantage. Yeah. Uh, now, look at what's happening in the Sahel region already. Yeah. You know, so you don't want to compound the situation. But that's why we have, uh, like, the Accra Initiative, for example. It's really working where they share intelligence. Right. So that if you are somebody who has been declared a persona non grata, you are not allowed to infiltrate. Yeah, so I, I, I think that the benefits outweigh the, 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 the negatives. Uh, we, so we should take advantage if it presents itself as, as a nation. Okay. Yeah. What will be your message to the Ghanaian community uh, out there in South Africa and those living here in Ghana? Yeah, so uh, I would always say that uh, South Africa is a beautiful country. Uh, the opportunities in South Africa, uh, if you ask Ghanaians who have been in South Africa, some have made it. Uh, but some are also struggling. Uh, that's life. Right. Uh, people travel to the U.S., they travel to the U.K., they travel to a lot of these countries hoping to make, make it. it. But then some do end up making Others also are not lucky. So uh, uh, we can't take South Africa out of this mix. Again, uh, in terms of the security challenges, I agree that uh, it's something that we should be mindful of as, as, as a people. Uh, so I'm urging Ghanaians that please uh, be each other's keeper. Uh, look out for each other, and then let's stay safe in South Africa. Uh, I know that, uh, like they say, uh, home sweet home. But now we are out there trying to make a living, you know, for ourselves and then our families back home. Uh, let's try to be law abiding. Uh, I was saying that there was an argument that we were raising when we were negotiating for right. this. Uh, we wanted to say that uh, Ghanaians already in South Africa, who had, you know, those who had overstayed and then have no criminal record. Uh, we wanted them to be given some form amnesty. of amnesty so that uh, they can regularize their stay. Uh, that didn't work out this time. Uh, but then we are hopeful that when the review, uh, when time for review comes up, uh, we may have a second look at this. Because there are so many Ghanaians that I've met who are contributing to the economy of South Africa, doing really, really well, law-abiding, right. no criminal record and all. Why can't we give them an amnesty? You know? Indeed. Yes, the only crime yes. was to seek uh, green opportunities. opportunities. Yes. So I think that once uh, we meet again for a review of this agreement, this, are some, that this is something that consideration we may want to put across to you know, for, the, uh, for the South African side to have a look at. And indeed, uh, congratulations uh, on I'm the streets. We are looking forward to more vacations and also uh, other activities in South, 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 South Africa. South Africa again. again. <laughs> this time you will not run away. <laughs> not at all. I will uh, do that. I'll host you. <laughs> In Charles is the I'm uh, High Commissioner of Ghana in South Africa joining us uh, here uh, on the polls. It's a good time to cross you over to the Electoral Commission's he- headquarters where uh, Samuel Tete, the Deputy EC Commissioner in charge of operations, is addressing a news conference. As you see there, we're crossing over now. Yes. Thank you. We would like to use this forum to thank you, the media, for the support you gave to the work of the Electoral Commission. 
we are again entreating you to use your media organizations to promote the district assembly erections. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Tizen. Um, we want to go ahead with the question and answers. We want you to do the thing somewhere. So we will have the questions and answer session. So as the practice has always been, please come this way what as a person. You identify your yourself by mentioning your name and the organization you present to so answer your question. When we are done, we will give the opportunity for the the the, the non-English speaking station, that's why the key happened, to also come out with their presence and commissioner will respond to them so they can also uh, benefit from the whole session. And so please, let's do the need for um, the sample of presence. If you have any person, come out this way and let's take it.
Okay, so the first um, question is um, with respect to uh, those people who registered at the district offices and then maybe the police stations that they were placed. You see, the reason why I said that those who registered in 2023 should not go to the district office is very simple. You may think that because at that time the um, registration center was the district office, you may be tempted to go to the district office. However, when the applicant went to the district office to register, he was asked where he stays and if he has um, evidence of um, maybe the police stations that he registered into. So the registration officers registered them into police stations at where they reside. And if you give your location vividly, you are put into the correct polling stations. So that is the reason why I said they shouldn't go to the district office because it is not an exhibition what center. The polling stations are designated as what? Exhibition centers. So all police stations are designated exhibition centers. And uh, it is very, very important for those who registered in 2023 because the exercise was done at the district office to go and then check and then find out not only the correction of their details, but to also know exactly where they are placed. So that if it is something like um, police station A, B, or C, or whatever, you will be able to know that this is the police station that I was registered into. The, the second, let me look at the second one, the spillage of the Akosovo Dam. As for other particulars, I can't actually speak to that. But if it is the voter ID card that you have lost, if your name is properly entered into the voters' register, you can still vote without the voters' ID card. So whether you have the voters' ID card or not, on the day of the election, if you are able to know the police, the difficulty is that if you go to the wrong police station, you are going to waste everybody's time because we'll be going through the register, through, through, and then we may not be finding you and all that. But if you go to the right police station, you will be, your name will be on the register and you'll be allowed to vote. The, the 50 pesos charge is not part of what we sent to uh, Parliament for under the fees and the service uh, charge or what. I think this one is part of uh, the, the services that uh, he rendered by the service provider. Um, you, you were talking about the CI 128, which is the, I think, the parliamentary constituency. Um, uh, what we did was that, you know, the CI was amending the 128 to enable us to create the Kwan constituency was sent to parliament. So, in the process, definitely it will be gazetted. It is not the EC which is responsible for gazetting. So the Attorney General Office will take those necessary steps to do the gazetting for the CI to go through, assuming that the Commission would want to create the constituency. Um, the other one is the short code for how long is it going to last. Throughout the exhibition period and at the same time till the end of the year. So from this time, this time up to the end of the year, um, the, 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 the short code will be in use. Thank you.
this is me. The live pictures there from uh, the Electoral Commission's headquarters, Samuel uh, Deputy EC Chair, addressing the press uh, on the creation of some new constituencies uh, and giving updates on some of the activities of the uh, Commission, which we'll bring to you subsequently uh, in our bulletins. But uh, it's a time now to, good time now to talk about this, because this week uh, the Ghana Chamber of Mines is celebrating what they call the Safety Week, and guess what? They are introducing a health uh, competition called the National uh, Intermines Fest Aid and Safety Competition. Uh, the competition is designed to educate mine workers, uh, also host uh, communities and uh, citizenry on basic first aid tips, as well as uh, to foster some consciousness of safety in our everyday lives. So why don't we talk about this? Uh, joining me in studio now is uh, Nana Ando uh, and uh, Adlid Yangsen. Uh, we also have Nana Ando, who is the environment uh, consultant uh, to the Ghana Chamber of Mines, and Adlid Yangsen is the occupational health and safety superintendent uh, for the Precious uh, mine in Ghana Limited. They are both uh, joining us uh, in studio, and it's a good time to welcome you, Nana uh, and Lady, for Thank joining you. us in studio. Thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, so let's talk about you know the need for safety. Very often, uh, Ghanaians are flippant about that, uh, Nana, because uh, you you find us feeling that God will take control almost all the time. So we throw you know first aid and safety um, uh, you know, away. But why is it so important for our everyday life? Why do we need to be cautious about safety? Well, thank you very much. And um, I think I'm <clears throat> the first thing is that um, um, normally we say um, your life, it's in your hands, okay? So safety is taking care of yourself, being very conscious of exactly what you are doing because lack of safety brings a whole lot of things, you know. You can get injured, you can get sick, you know. So these are things. So this year, our, our theme is that safety every day, mm. that implies that you have a, a, a healthy living all the time. I see. Right. Um, so, Adlid, what are some of the activities uh, for us to expect in terms of what you'd be uh, carrying out in the course of the period? Okay, so as Nana rightly said, yes. Um, we started this on zonal basis. Mm -hmm. We had the zonal among the mining companies. So those who emerge as winners now would meet as the, for the national competition. So we'll first have the orals on the national uh, BBC. Okay. Then we have the practical section. The intent is to educate the community and the citizenry of the first aid because we realize most of our people are not exposed yeah. to this. Okay, so this would be open to everybody in terms of the competition? Or you have selected, you know, some... Okay, so yeah. what I said earlier, mm -hmm. we mm. have a different mining companies Company. that are okay. competing. Right, yeah. so it's not, it's not open to, to the, the general... Yeah, no, it's not the okay. mining, mining com companies. Yeah. Uh, okay, um, for how long will you, will you be running this uh, in terms of the activities to mark, you know, the, the safety uh, week? Well, um... The, the, the history behind this safety competition is uh, it dates as far back as in the 70s. Right. And the idea is that <clears throat> um, initially, yes. I mean, uh, uh, safety consciousness, on, even on the mining companies, was such that uh, people would even discourage their, their, their wars from working yes. in their mind. Mm. Because they say that place is a, a death trap. Yeah. Go there. Danger zone. <laughs> a danger zone. So uh, it got to a point where yeah, the, the industry decided, look, we have to be very safety conscious. And that means that at least if somebody is going to work and he knows he will go and work safely and come back home, that in itself attracts a lot of people you know, to the work. 
Now, the competition, as we, we're talking about, has been organized in situation. There have been 15, 14 mining companies, as she said, yes. gone through the, the, the normal, um, um, what do you call it? The, the zonal, the zonal, zonal ones. Four of right. them are now qualified for the finals, which comes on on Sunday. We expect people to sit by their TVs on Sunday. It's the reason why I was asking about you, you know, public participation, what you're expecting from them. How do you want them to support the process as well? Well, I, uh, just, just sit by your, 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 your <laughs> and TV center there. <laughs> in fact, earlier before the COVID, what we used to do was yeah. to do this in, in the communities. Right. So that if, for example, this year, Ghana Manganese uh, Institute is hosting, okay. all the companies would have assembled there and then everything would have been done and in yeah. the community so that the communities also you know, participate because of the COVID. But I think we're still thinking of uh, going back to the communities for next year. Days, yeah. Yeah, which we'll be doing. Yeah. Uh, so, so uh, Adelaide, for you, what, what would you like the public to know about you know, safety and, uh, as we look forward to the competition? Okay, so, <clears throat> sorry. So for the public, now what we want them to go is we want, it's, it's, it's a form of creating awareness, people to learn first aid. We realize in our world, part of the world, this is lacking. So this certain by their TV, at least one will learn how to respond to certain emergencies. And this will be helpful in our various homes. And uh, as Nana said, we're doing it in the host communities to benefit the traditional people within the mining uh, catchment area to learn. But we are now bringing it to the larger uplands to also know what we are doing. Uh, Nana, and for, for the mining uh, communities, uh, beyond you know, just uh, carrying out this quiz competition and all of that, uh, what more activities are you putting in place to create more awareness on, on the safety issues? In fact, um, we have even safety brigades among, among the communities, okay. which are organized you know, by, by the mining companies. And um, we catch them very young, you know, right from right. the beginning, start teaching. Training. You know, a lot of times uh, an accident occurs, and before people are even transferred from the accident spot to the hospital, they are already gone. It means that first aid is very, very important. That is why we lay so much emphasis on what to be done immediately, you know, after, say, there's a, an accident or some, um, an outrage, something like that, what should be done. And that is very important to sustain the people. Yes. Uh, would you recommend that this, this be you know, replicated in schools, in you know, churches, just, just as a way of creating more, more awareness? Yes, in fact, uh, that, 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 is a, that is a larger, larger way we're looking at it. Yeah. But from the beginning, you know, it's, it's been getting a lot of uh, support from the communities, especially when we had a community um, uh, um, uh, safety yeah. teams also participating. They were also, you know, also participating in a, in contest, so that we come up with a, a community which is which is you know, far better than the all the others. Yeah. To yeah. To what mm, Nana mm, is saying. Yes. Currently, we also have the student base one. Okay. So they write essay okay. pertaining to mining activities, their effects on them, and how they can also learn about the mining operations. So that's part of this competition that we are uh, that will come on this Sunday. This Sunday, okay. So, we, atta- uh, we also have the lower uh, school children that is the basic level mm-hmm. are taking it as well. Uh, any special focus on women as well? <laughs> because we know that they care the more, isn't it? <laughs> I, do you have any plans for that? On that? Okay, yes. Mm-hmm. So when you look at the, uh, the student one that we yes. do, the, mm-hmm. the community, most of the time the population, the number of people that we get, women to men, we have the, the women ratios, more yeah. than the... <laughs> yes. Because I think we are more interested in caring mm-hmm. for people, right. yes, and we have that empathy more than. Yeah, we also do sometimes. <laughs> 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 right. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, what would be the final words, Nana, Nana um, to our viewers and, and to the general public? What they need to know. Yes, um, there, there are a lot of um, uh, safety uh, things. Probably, I will just give one one tip. You know, um, one tip. Okay. Safety tip. For That's very important. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, um, these days, now, you know, everybody's using um, mobile phones, mm-hmm. you know, and what intrigues me so much is that um, people go to filling stations yes. and they, 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 have... they, use, they use their mobile phones there. And in fact, even with their, with their, with their um, uh, cars running, you know, why is they are refueling? It's, it's a tip that we're trying to give to people that uh, from now on, I think it's, uh, it's very important that once you go to a filling station to fill, just switch off your engine and then 
don't don't even if you have a call, just leave it. What are the risks associated with that? Because a lot of people don't know about it. Yes, because it it can really trigger, mm. you know, trigger um, any explosion. Uh, yes, mm. fire fire this thing. You know that is why we are very very careful about that. So at least we, it's it's a safety tip that we would like to. No, communicate. And I tell you what, this National Intermines uh, first aid competition, you need to be watching because you'll be learning a lot more uh, as Nana is putting out. Adelaide, any final words to our viewers? Okay, so my final words to our viewers is first care, first responder right. is very key in every incident scenario or situation. So we all watch, get the basic knowledge that you can apply in your various homes. Okay, uh, I'm grateful, Nana Ando, uh, who is an environmental consultant to the Ghana Chamber of Mines, and also Adley uh, Youngson, Occupational Health and Supply uh, Safety Superintendent at Precious Mining Ghana Limited. I'm grateful uh, that you've spent some time with us. Uh, we're looking forward to the National Intermines uh, First Aid and Safety Competition, and of course you'll be learning a lot more. Uh, about this. Uh, time now to talk about some uh, other developments uh, because uh, the youth of Garo and Timpani in the Upper East region are demanding an unqualified apology from the Ministry of National Security and the Ghana Armed Forces for the brutality meted out to civilians in the two districts uh, at dawn on Sunday, a joint press conference in the Garo community. The uh, youth uh, also demanded a full-scale investigation into the incident. According to them, some uh, personal belongings of some of the civilians were taken away uh, from them and must be returned. Imano uh, Isaka uh, spoke on behalf of the community. These unprofessional military men claim that some of the some alleged foreign national security operatives who were in Garu on an official assignment. Their first falsehood peddled by the Ministry of National Security. Ladies and gentlemen, permit us to set the record straight on some falsehood and half-truth peddled by the Ministry of National Security in their 29th October press release. One, the Ministry of National Security claimed that the Arab youth attacked the vehicle when the officers were seated in the Land Cruiser vehicle with registration number GS 7520-22, which was removed and kept aside the vehicle. This is not accurate. The record should reflect that the officers were not in the vehicle, but rather inside the police station at the time the unknown assailants fired gunshots into the vehicle. The claim by the, NASA, the Minister of National Security that the officers shot refuge at the police, the Garu police station is woefully, is, is wholly inaccurate and yet another attempt to create disaffection for the people of Garu and Tepani. It, it was rather the vigilant youth who requested that the claim officers go with them from the, their hideout to the police station to authenticate their identity. If the Minister of National Security claimed that their barbaric act and unprofessional conduct was to retrieve the weapons used in attacking the vehicle, at least the DCEs were present at the time of the torture. We ask. Where are the six weapons? Yes, there are no single reported incident of the retrieval of weapons from any of the homes invaded. We ask, did the Minister of National Security and the military invade and visit such heinous crimes on the people of Wale Wale when a VIP bus that loaded passengers from Kumasi was burned into ashes no. at the Wale Wale police station? No! no. Why the people of Garu and Tripathi? Oh, start. Okay. On Tuesday, background to the issue. Well, uh, some youth of uh, Garu uh, and Timpani have also been expressing their frustration and making some demands uh, of government to take the laws into our hands but we will not come out as workers in the town whilst we are being beaten 
whilst our items are taken from us, whilst our leaders are still in police custody, and we don't even know where they are whereabouts. for us. The whole of Ghana, if it is really true that those boys they have arrested and airlifted them to Accra are really militants, as the whole country is speculating. The cause of our land yes. will speak for us. Yes. Yes. The second one had to do with the arms. The whole country is penalized about the people of Garu, the good people of Garu, that we have taken two arms. If it is true, the cause of our land in this country, not Garu alone, the whole of the cause of the land of the whole of Ghana will speak for us. We take you now to Parliament uh, because uh, the Speaker of the House, Alban Babin, has ordered a parliamentary probe into the Ekosombo Dam spillage that has left thousands of residents uh, in at least uh, seven regions uh, displaced and properties running into millions of cities destroyed. A section of the public has criticized the Volta River Authority, uh, which undertook the spillage for not sensitizing the affected communities enough. Uh, enough uh, due to the incidents that we've seen within the community. Parliamentary Affairs correspondent Kwekwa Sante uh, now reports on the latest. Parliament had been on recess all this period whilst several communities had been taken over by the floods caused by the spillage of the Akosumbo Dam. Whilst the human suffering in these communities continue, Parliament is now set to take some action on their behalf. Minority leader Dr. Kisilato Fosen, in his welcome remarks, announced his side was going to file a private member's motion to demand a probe. In the last few weeks, Mr. Speaker, we have witnessed arguably the biggest man-made disaster to ever befall our nation. I am referring to the devastation caused by the spillage of the Akotombo Dam by the Volta River Authority. Mr. Speaker, as minority caucus, our hearts bleed for all the victims of this man-made disaster, which has rendered several thousands of people homeless and swept away farms, destroyed livelihood of many people in parts of Oti region, Volta region, Eastern region, Greater Accra region, Bono East, Savannah, and Northern regions. Mr. Speaker, the affected communities and regions have yet to recover from the aftermath of this disaster. The conduct of both the government and the Volta River Authority in terms of leading a coordinated emergency response and disaster relief effort leaves much to be desired. Right Honorable Speaker, I conclude by saying that we hereby serve notice that we will present a motion to demand a parliamentary inquiry into the circumstances that led to a man-made disaster of such magnitude. The majority leader of Sei Chi Men Sabunsu focused on the politicization of the floods but insisted the VRA must be brought before MPs to answer questions. The House may have to invite the VRA to brief us on the situation relating to the spillage and all other connected matters. The Speaker, I believe the Minister um, responsible for water resources and indeed energy as well. It is scary, Mr. Speaker. There's 10 some Ghanaians, including some MPs, go to politicize every single event in this country. As MPs, one of our core responsibilities is to inform and by that educate the citizenry. Speaker of Parliament, Alban Bagwin, has now ordered that the House conducts an inquiry into the floods and the VRE's actions. It is unacceptable that an activity as potentially destructive as dam spillage was done without a well thought through security and safety preparedness plan. As such, Parliament will take the necessary action to inquire into the matter and make recommendations for the protection of property and lives living along the Volta River and Lake and other settlements along river beds. Honorable members, this is a national assignment 
and ballot partners should be seen to be leading in finding solutions to this somehow perennial problem confronting the nation. It is not clear which form exactly this probe that has been ordered by the Speaker will take, but it will normally come in two forms. Either a special committee will be constituted with members from either side of the House to look into these matters, or an existing standing committee will be asked to look into these matters. But of course, it must be put on record that the NDC MPs have had some strong words for the Volta River Authority, which they say have spearheaded this man-made disaster in the Volta region. But one thing that has stood out in this matter on the floor of the House is that both sides have spoken about the need for government and other individuals to move in to restore life to normalcy. Reporting for Joy News, Riku Asante, Parliament House, Accra. Riku Asante there with the latest. Uh, on and to uh, the Sisale East municipal Municipality because the Chief Executive uh, Hussein Yakubu Baton has expressed worry over the increasing uh, rate of stillbirth and teenage pregnancy cases recorded in the municipality. He indicates that stillbirth cases rose from 4.9 to 5.9 and teenage pregnancy fell uh, from 10 to 9.7 in the year under review. Hussein Yakubu Abatong expressed the worry at the second ordinary meeting of the Assembly in Tumu. Rafiq Salam reports. The second ordinary meeting of the Sisala East Municipal Assembly is the last for this current Assembly before the district level election are held in December. Presiding member of the Socialist Municipal Assembly, Doa Sumela, says the board ruling for the meeting urging members to approve the budget of the Assembly to never it be in sync with the national budget. We are obliged as an Assembly to look at plans, projects, programs, activity within the municipality adjust or otherwise of the fees that assembly deem it necessary to generate revenue for the municipality and also to consider some budget discrepancy budget that is supposed to be fair into the national budget which for us is that we will put it before government, hopefully in the middle of next month, we begin to know. It is now our obligation to also get the budget approved at our municipal level so that this year can be harmonized in the national budget for us to also benefit from any form of project or program. That is likely to emanate from the central government to the municipal level. Sasara is municipal chief executive. Hussein Yoko Batong used the opportunity to enumerate some success shock under the period in review in the various sectors. At 93.3%, 93 which is above the set target of 60% for the year. This was achieved through the deployment of midwives to achieve zones and improvement in monitoring and delivery services. However, it is sad to note that I was still like I was still birth rate rose from 4.9 to 5.9, and teenage pregnancy rate teenage pregnancy rate fell from 10 to 9.7. The other was unhappy with the increasing rate of stillbirth and teenage pregnancy. Deputy Minister for Sanitation and Water Resources, Amidu Chine Isaku, who also doubles as a member of parliament for the Cesar East constituency, urged them to pursue development for the municipality, devoid of partisanship, religion, or ethnicity. As let's pursue development for this municipality, devoid of partisan politics, devoid of religion, and any other sectionality. When it comes to development, let me focus on what we do for the municipality. When it is time for campaign, we can go to our various parties and talk for our parties. But at the assembly level, let's be together, let's work together, let's support each other 
so that collectively we can pursue development for the Sisalese municipality. If we are divided, we can achieve very little. But if we are together, whatever be the case, we are able to do something better for the municipality. So Reporting for Joy News, Rafik Salam, Tumu. And you're still with us here on the Polls and Joy News channel. We're taking a break. We'll be right back. Please stay. Your favorite TV game show, Step Up, is back with another amazing season. This time, we are stepping up with Syntex Tank. Step Up with Syntex Tank will see contestants answer questions of their choice and win over 6,000 Ghana CDs cash prize weekly and other products from our sponsors. This season, viewers at home should watch out for the Syntex Tank question of the week. Be the first to answer correctly via WhatsApp or send SMS to 050-833-8888 and win incredible prizes. The person who answers most of the weekly questions correctly and fastest gets a 65-inch Samsung TV at the end of the season. Step up with Syntex Tan, showing on Joy Prime every Sunday, 7.30 p.m. Sponsored by Bell Eyes, MTN Momo, Angel Cola, powered by Syntex Tan. Joy Prime, your ultimate experience. Prepare for an exhilarating experience at the main fair of the 2023 Ecobank Joy News Habitat Fair. Join us at the Accra International Conference Center from Thursday, November 23rd to Sunday, November 26th, 2023. Doors will be open from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. each day to welcome you. This year, we are diving into the theme of home ownership, exploring the nuances between affordability, comfort, and luxury. Whether you're embarking on your home ownership journey or looking for upgrades, this fair is your destination for all things housing. Encounter a comprehensive assembly of stakeholders from Ghana's housing and construction sectors. Engage the experts across the spectrum of home creation and enhancement. The Ecobank Joy News Habitat Fair is in partnership with Ecobank, the Pan-African Bank, and powered by the Plan City Extension Project from Cities and Habitats. Rent to Own and sponsored by Elegant Homes and General Constructions Limited, where quality meets value. Global Lighting, your solution to quality lighting. Syntex Tank, air strong, air tough. Springfield Estates, where dreams are built. Virtual Security, complete security solution. DBS, your roof experts. Virtual InfoSec Africa, security solutions by design. St. Gobain, making the world a better plan. Clifton Homes, Beautiful homes, wise investments. The Kissington Heights, Airport City, Kumasi, by HDG Homes Limited. Africa, Africa, Africa. 